Hello, and welcome to the Church Nerd Podcast. This is Andrew. In honor of the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, we're here to talk about the mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. What, you're expecting an episode all about animals and Francis-shaped bird baths? No, we'll leave that base-level stuff for another time. In fact, if I get three new subscribers to my Patreon page, I will make a members-exclusive episode just about Francis, the myths, and his hagiography. That's a fancy word for saint stuff. Today, we're diving right into the church nerd deep end, so cinch up your habits, dust off your alms bowls, because we're about to take on the Urban Friars. As mendicant orders, such as the Franciscans and the Dominicans, grew across Europe in the 13th century, Scholars have since noted that this spread followed growing or established urban centers. However, is it enough to assume that the mendicants merely followed the populations that could offer them charity? Could mendicant friars have come into existence or done any useful work before urban life began to flourish in medieval Europe? Well, first, what do we mean when we say mendicant orders? Mendicant monks were those that focused on holy poverty, teaching, and preaching, and eschewed. First of all, what do we mean when we say mendicant orders? Mendicant monks were those monks that focused on holy poverty, teaching, and preaching in a way that differed from Benedictines or other monastic groups that focused on established cloisters and monasteries in remote locations. To our modern eyes, these medieval mendicants were like hobos, imitating the apostles by traveling from town to town, preaching and living off the charity that they received from those they encountered. So, with that out of the way, let's get into some real detail. The Order of Friars Minor, Franciscans, was officially established by Pope Honorus III's encyclical, Solet Anieri, in 1223. Francis, of course, envisioned a small group of brothers who were dedicated to a life of poverty, simplicity, and preaching. Through dedication to God, Christ, and Lady Poverty, the Franciscans were meant to live as early apostles did, owning nothing and traveling the land to preach the gospel. Like the friars themselves, Franciscan preaching was expected to be simple yet intentional. It was to be studied and chaste, useful and edifying to the people, telling them about vices and virtues, punishments and glory, and it ought to be brief. I wish we could say the same for modern-day preachers from time to time. Anyway, the main occupation of the friars at this time was the preaching of repentance, work in which Francis himself played a large part. If friars did any other work, it was only to meet their immediate needs, or those needs of their brothers. They were not allowed to accept money for labor, and any compensation they did receive was to be done humbly, as one who seeks holy poverty. Their focused abandonment on material possessions allowed the mendicants to freely travel, to preach repentance, and to spread the gospel through an example of apostolic poverty. Like their Franciscan contemporaries, The Order of Preachers, what we call Dominicans, was officially established by Honorus III's encyclical Religiosum Vitam in 1216. The Dominicans, observing the rule of Augustine, share many similar characteristics with the Franciscans, including a dedication to preaching and a rejection of material possessions in favor of poverty. As the Dominicans were officially founded earlier than the Franciscans, they had a head start traveling farther and wider. Even early on, the Dominicans had a focus on education and study to help inform their preaching, but more on that later. So what was the big deal with these newfangled mendicants? What was the draw? The appeal of the mendicants was in large part due to the changing social structure of the time, as well as an authentic imitation of the apostolic lifestyle, 
that really resonated with the population. Religious orders were nothing new in the 13th century. Clearly, the Benedictines had long established abbeys and monasteries, set far away from the rest of civilization. However, those communities reflected the feudal society in which they were created. Mendicant orders were born from the ashes of feudal Europe, as people were moving away from remote baronies and fiefdoms and were relocating to towns, larger cities, and urban areas. As populations evacuated the countryside for cities, they left these abbeys and monasteries behind. And though Benedictine monasticism accepted the nobles and the lowborn, there was still a little bit of class and society still built into those established structures. The mendicants, on the other hand, leveled every amount of social standing and stripped away all possessions and material desire. As a friar, it didn't matter if your family had great wealth or not, because you came into your habit with nothing. Provost Burchard of Ersberg, a contemporary of Dominic and Francis, believed that the friars offered devout Christians an experience that was authentic, orthodox, and worthy of their efforts, as opposed to the existing Christian experience that was frequently lived in a heretical fashion. He believed that the friars were the orthodox solution for lax Christendom, and he seemed to have a point as membership in the mendicant orders grew and grew. Older monastic orders no longer attracted those who wished to leave the world and instead attracted those who resided in the growing urban areas. In order to serve the faithful, friars had to meet them where they were, in towns. And while Benedictine communities treasured the stability that they found in their monasteries, with their chapels and libraries and the like, the friars were free of those attachments and headed straight for the people in the towns, cities, and urban areas. In the early 13th century, both Dominicans and Franciscan friars had spread to cities across Europe and were gaining attention of the larger Catholic Church. There was obviously a need for this type of religious life, evident by the fact that the Dominicans were given papal recognition only a year after the Fourth Lateran Council declared a prohibition on new religious orders. As if in a symbiotic relationship, mendicant orders followed urban growth, and the growth of those towns benefited from the presence of the friaries. You could tell whether or not a settlement was important and wealthy in the High Middle Ages by seeing if any friaries were found there. And so, while the spread of the mendicants across medieval Europe cities is noteworthy, what's truly amazing is how rapidly they did it. For instance, St. Francis was converted to Christianity in 1206 at the age of 23 or 24. He received initial approval for his order by Pope Innocent III only three or four years later in 1209 or 1210. Within a few years, there are records of Franciscans established across places like Portugal in 1217. Rome in 1218, France in 1219, Germany in 1221, and England in 1228. Mendicant reach into England may have started a little late, but once the friars reached the island, their popularity spread with a particular zeal. The Order of Friars Minor was officially approved by Pope Honorius III in 1223, only 13 years after initial permission is given, and it had stretched nearly across all of Western Europe. And while the friars were an urban phenomenon, establishing their houses in larger cities, they soon developed a regular series of visits to rural and distant parishes within their area called a limitatio, and there they would preach and hear confession. However, when any organization experiences rapid growth, it often must alter its mission statement or guiding principles to reflect this new reality. What works in a small scale does not always translate into the macro. And thus we encounter the shift. When mendicant orders grew as large as they did so quickly, change was inevitable, especially in the case of the Franciscans. Certain policy changes redefined what Francis himself may have considered holy poverty. In 1230, four years after his death, the Franciscans reached a major turning point with the announcement of Pope Gregory IX's encyclical, Quo Ilangati. This encyclical determined that while Franciscans could not own property, houses, or currency themselves, they could make use of donations given to the Holy See on their behalf. From here on, the order was set on a path of modest security, 
The friars were to be housed in solid and dignified convents, and they were to have all the advantages of money, even if they never saw any of it. In many ways, this softened the Franciscans, who no longer had to beg for food in the cold and damp. They were not forced to spend many hours in the streets with the townsfolk. Instead, they could stay in their comfortable houses and convents, collecting books and studying. This brought them several steps closer to the monastic cousins which they had originally eschewed. Furthermore, it was exactly what Francis had forbade the order from doing in his testament, written near the end of his life. By 1232, the order was moving away from poverty and closer toward security, moving away from simplicity and closer toward academic learning, and further and further away from humility and closer and closer to power and privilege. In England, the coddling of the Franciscans was so bad that Henry III attempted to give state funds to relieve the friars from their begging, but they refused. Eventually, however, Much of the land and buildings that the friars made use of belonged to private citizens. The ease with which the Franciscans were either given or able to find modest comfort took all of the fire out of their bellies. For the first time, the Franciscans had abundance. Even if they did not technically own it, they still had access to all that they needed. The Dominicans, on the other hand, did not seem to struggle with the philosophy of money the same way the Franciscans did. As the Dominicans' primary focus was on theological education, teaching, and preaching, they had clear intentions of establishing schools and centers of learning from the beginning. Because of this, they were much less afraid of settling down and establishing themselves in a particular place. Whereas the original Franciscans had wanted that visceral, primitive, apostolic experience spreading the gospel on foot, the Dominicans used their vow of poverty to focus their minds on education and preaching. But now that the Franciscans had time and money to further educate themselves, they began to catch up academically to their Dominican brothers. And thus we have the War of the Universities. Okay, well, war is a bit dramatic, but hear me out. As we see in modern Franciscans and Dominicans, we know that the Dominican friars both have long histories of theological education and preaching. This is due in part to the 13th century, As we have noted, the mendicants were drawn into urban areas and eventually had the means and time to fund their own educations, as well as to provide education for those around them. Part of this was by necessity. With the growing number of literati in urban areas, mendicant preaching needed to meet the demands of a population that could read. Their lessons and message moved away from oratory and morality and moved toward more formal sermons and discourses. And while preaching had always been a focus of the Franciscans, they truly owe their academics to the Dominicans. Proper theological study was part of the original fabric of the Dominican order in a way that it never really was with the Franciscans. And as the Franciscans eventually reorganized their order during the chapter general of 1239 following their massive expansion, they did so along Dominican lines. The Dominicans noticed that the Franciscans were starting to encroach on their corner of the wider mendicant landscape. When the Franciscans arrived in Paris in 1219, they admired the already established Dominican school they found there. And as they were increasingly drawn to academic life, the Franciscans began to fashion their own school based on the university model that the Dominicans had already borrowed. When four university masters took up Franciscan habits, the order was able to start their own school in 1229. This school competed with a similar Dominican school in Paris, until the masters at the University of Paris went on a temporary strike. Upon the university master's return, they found that many of their students had simply enrolled in either of the other mendicant schools, which now shared much more comfortable standing as a result. This healthy competition between the Dominicans and Franciscans in Paris spilled over into other university towns like Oxford, as mendicant schools of theology were either established in the shadow of other major universities or were incorporated into a university's theological college, the prestige of mendicant theological education grew. The friars, who had been formed by city ministry over the years, were highly adept learners and teachers. Their focus on concise preaching and edification of the masses served them very well as instructors. However, the friars did more than just sit in the lecture halls of Oxford and Paris. 
the Dominicans and Franciscans had become highly sought-after preachers across Europe, both in smaller towns and in little villages, which were serviced by that convent's area, their limitatio. Mendicant preaching had become such a regular fixture in medieval life that it even influenced the architecture of churches in cities. Early on, friars constructed their convents such that the dining rooms were close to street entrances, facilitating lay people to walk in off the street and converse with them. This led to larger and larger dining halls where friars could preach to larger and larger crowds. Eventually, this influenced a distinctive but now ubiquitous form of church architecture, the long open nave. These churches began to spring up all over Europe, with single open naves where increasingly slender pillars were set as wide apart as could be safely done. As the Franciscans' reputation grew, sermons and preaching became less oratory and more dogmatic, and preachers were not sent out as casually. Preachers now had to be educated, trained, and licensed by the minister general. This theological education and training took place either at university or at a local convent under the instruction of a house lecturer, who had himself been trained at Paris or Oxford. Each convent was tasked with supplying one or more potential students to university if they could afford it. At the same time, Dominicans had their own scholastic requirements. Each convent housed a doctor who gave lectures to the friars, including the prior, and they were all required to attend. Larger convents also opened their lectures to lay clerics. Even larger, the lectures and courses at a Dominican university were conducted by a master, or regent, and two bachelors. So if it looks like the Franciscans changed dramatically from their humble beginnings in 1209 to where they ended up in the high Middle Ages, well, you're right. With any great advancement or level of accomplishment that runs the risk of overconfidence and elitism, So I'm going to share with you a Franciscan fable, or at least a fable that mocks the Franciscans common to that day. It's called The Smug Fox and the Humble Country Cat. The fox, who studied at Paris, brags to the cat about his cleverness and his ability to evade the humans as he hunts for their hens and their excellent capons. At that, the cat concedes that he only knows how to hunt mice. However, when the fox and cat are confronted by hunters, the cat leaps into a tree and looks down and asks the fox, who is being mauled by hunting dogs, where now is all that wisdom you learned in Paris? It seems that even the Franciscans of their day had become so comfortable in the lecture halls and in the chairs of higher education, they had gotten away from their humble beginnings in the countryside. And so the question remains, did the friars need urban civilization to do their work? Well, certainly there were humble proto-mendicants and pilgrims that lived simple ascetic lives well before Dominic and Francis came along. However, I don't believe that the Franciscans or the Dominicans could have lived the way they did or done the work that they had set out to do without urban civilization. I believe these orders were a response to urban growth, to shifting populations. They sought to meet a need that the established monastic orders were actively avoiding in their isolation. The friars depended upon the abundance and the disposable wealth and the charity of the urban communities. The Dominicans actively sought contact with the secular population in towns and countrysides and largely depended on the support for their material survival. For example, over time, the Franciscans shaped themselves to operate within the secular urban environment. The Regula Balata sets forth guidelines for their evangelical and pastoral life. Friars were forbidden to quarrel and argue, to be judgmental of outsiders. They were admonished to be meek, to be peaceful, modest, and humble, to be respectful in their speech, and are obliged to give away possessions in order to reach the state of evangelical poverty. When Francis wrote this rule, he knew that his brothers would be involved in urban ministry. To the extent that To the extent his vision was consistently carried out over the years prior to and following his death remains debatable. Franciscan leaders that followed Francis and policies like Quo Ilangati sent the Franciscans on a path that Francis directly opposed. While it helped solidify a growing order, it took the brothers further and further away from the spirit of the rule and the apostolic poverty that they had vowed. The Franciscans may have been born out of a need to evangelize to the cities, 
but they also fell victim to the temptations that those cities offered, namely wealth, comfort, and stability that Francis completely ran away from. By establishing themselves in cities, the Franciscans lost much of the primitive apostolic lifestyle that had made it so appealing in the first place. So while the Franciscans and Dominicans certainly existed and worked in the rural countryside, they really did find their growth and stability in the urban areas. They would not have found the longevity that they enjoy without embracing urban ministry, improved preaching through academics, and accepting the resources of the church and their benefactors, even if ownership of those resources remained separate. Perhaps the friars could have existed and done good works without urban areas, but they wouldn't have reached the levels they did or worked on the scale that we have seen. By settling into urban areas, they helped build them up. By dedicating themselves to preaching and by extension theological education, we would not have had Dante or Dun Scotus or Aquinas. I believe we owe the mendicant friars a great deal of thanks in establishing flourishing urban communities. And I believe we can use the mendicants as an example. Just as they were a response to the moving shifts of cultures from the countryside into the urban areas, I think we, as people of faith today, can see that the church needs to also get up and move, not into cities or into the countryside, because we're already there. We need to be digital. We need to move into the digital landscape. And that's part of what this podcast aims to do to bring some discussion of faith and Christian living online and into your pocket via smartphone. And if that's a message that you believe in as well, perhaps consider becoming a member and supporting the podcast through its Patreon page. Patrons of this podcast will get member exclusives, a bunch of free content that's only there on that Patreon page. You can give as little as a dollar a month and have full access. Or if you can afford a little more, you can do that. Remember, if I get three Patreon supporters as a result of this episode, I'll do a cutesy episode about Francis with all the animals. Well, that's all the time we have for today. This has been the Church Nerd Podcast, and as always, God bless. God bless.